Hi everyone, my name is Katie Connor. I'm an orthopedic surgery PA in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been working in PA education for about 10 years and one of the courses that I teach is anatomy. So I wanted to make a series of videos to kind of break down the nuts and bolts of anatomy for people designed to be at a professional program level. So paramedics, RNs, PAs, NPs, OTs, and PTs. This is the fourth in my video series on the human anatomy and the rest of them can be found either at pods.weebly.com or my YouTube page. So we're gonna get onto the last unit here and we're gonna start with our road maps, just like we've done in every other unit. Grab some blank paper and some colored pencils and we're gonna draw out the anatomical structures. So the first thing that we're gonna start with, and I'm gonna get rid of the video here, is the heart in circulation. It's really important that you can just rattle this off basically in your sleep because there's so many exam questions that come from this, both on your boards and your didactic gear, um, that, that there's easy points for you to gain. So we're gonna start over here to the left. Everything that's in blue is deoxygenated blood and it'll say negative O on there. And then as we get to the mixing, the capillaries, it'll be purple and then the oxygenated blood will be red. So we're gonna start with the venules and the veins and these drain into the vena cava and you have the superior and inferior vena cava. And as these drain, they'll drain into the right atrium. Remember that the atrium are the upper levels of the heart, whereas the ventricles are the lower levels. And so the right atrium, remember, if you try, you'll get it right. And you always try before you buy. So this has to do with the orders of the valve. So we're going to start in the right atrium. And if you try, you'll get it right. So we know that on the right side of the heart, we're going to go through the tricuspid AV valve. Then we're going to go through the right ventricle, and the right ventricle is going to pump us to our lungs. So we have to go through the pulmonary semilunar valve. Once we've gone through the pulmonary semilunar valve, we'll now be in the pulmonary artery. And this is an excellent exam question here because the pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. I'm going to say that again. The pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. All of the rest of the arteries carry oxygenated blood. So that's an excellent exam question. As we get to our lungs, we pick up oxygen and then we come back via the pulmonary veins and then we end up into the left atrium. Once we're in the left atrium, we go through the bicuspid or mitral valve through the left ventricle. The left ventricle pumps us through the aortic semilunar valve and then through the aorta. Once we're in the aorta, we're distributed back to the body through arteries and arterioles. When we land in the capillaries, that's where we're picking up the deoxygenated blood and dropping off the oxygenated blood for the tissues. So make sure you know all of these steps in order. And if you remember the key points, if you try, you'll get it right. You'll remember that the tricuspid valve comes on the right side. And if you try before you buy, the tricuspid comes before the bicuspid valve in the flow of blood. Next, we're gonna do our roadmaps. Um, for the abdominal veins is where we're gonna start here. So the venous supply to the abdomen. So as markers here, we have the diaphragm, we have the liver, we have the spleen, we have the, esoph uh, the esophagus, and then we have the heart. And so let's kind of work from here. So we're gonna start with the right subclavian vein. That was back in our first unit. We talked about an upper extremity. The right subclavian vein comes through the right brachiocephalic vein. You have also components from the right external jugular and the right internal jugular. On the left side, remember it's asymmetrical. So we have the left subclavian, the, the left brachiocephalic, the external jugular and the left internal jugular. And then it drains in through the superior vena cava. And the reason they look asymmetrical at the top there where the brachiocephalic veins are is because they are asymmetrical. Your right brachiocephalic is a lot shorter than your left brachiocephalic as far as where it laves in the thoracic cavity. So the superior vena cava is going to drain the top half of the body. Then we have another part called the azagos vein, and this is deep to those veins. The azagos has another supply, it's the accessory hemiazagos, the hemiazagos. So that is a deep supply to those others. Then we're going to go down into the abdominal cavity, and we're going to drain the spleen with the splenic vein. You also have the inferior mesenteric and the superior mesenteric, and all three of these come together into the hepatic portal vein. The reason this is clinically important is if you have any kind of GI cancer where you have a hematogenous spread, once it gets into the hepatic portal vein, it kind of it indicates metastasis and that you're you know, getting to the point where you're going to need chemotherapy usually. Okay. The hepatic portal vein drains into the liver. 
And then the liver drains through the hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava, and then it goes into the heart. So once you have those cancer cells that spread through the hepatic portal vein, it goes in the inferior vena cava, it goes into the heart and kind of gets transported around the body. Then we also have the left and the right renal veins. So this is the most important summary of the venous blood supply to the abdomen and thoracic cavities. Next, we're gonna go into the thoracic arteries. And just to set this up here, we have the rib cage, we have the clavicle, we have the phrenic nerve, the main stem bronchi, the ribs, the esophagus, and the diaphragm and the aortic arch. These are kind of our landmarks that we'll use. Okay. So we're gonna start off on the aortic arch, the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian. That's what we'll start with. Off of the brachiocephalic trunk, we have the right subclavian and the right, and the right common carotid. Remember that it is asymmetrical. The right side is different from the left side. Okay. Off of the subclavian, we have the costo cervical trunk. We talked about this in the last unit when we did head and neck. And then we have the superior intercostal arteries. As the right subclavian goes underneath the clavicle, it becomes the internal thoracic. And then the internal thoracic is where we're going to see some branches here. So our first branch, as we go and we're kind of traveling with the phrenic nerve, is going to be the pericarticophrenic. Then we have the anterior intercostal branches. So this is supplying blood to the anterior part of the rib cage. The musculophrenic, which is supplying blood to the diaphragm area and the superior epigastric, so the top part of kind of the GI area. The superior epigastric and the inferior epigastric are gonna anastomose, and we're gonna see this on the next slide here as how they come together. Now we're gonna concentrate on the center here, and as the aortic arch starts to make a downward term, it's called the descending aorta. As it goes past the main stem bronchi, it's now called the thoracic aorta, and we have a couple branches off of here. So we have the bronchial artery, we have the mediastinal artery. We have the esophageal artery. The posterior intercostal branches. So we have the anterior and the posterior intercostal branches now. The pericardial artery. And the superior phrenic artery. And then finally, the subcostal artery. So this is the breakdown of the arterial flow in the thoracic cavity. Next, we're gonna to go to the abdominal aorta and we're gonna make a map out of this one. So we're starting at the aortic hiatus in the diaphragm. That's our top landmark there. We also have the landmarks of the left renal vein and the kidneys. Our little mnemonic here is ice cream sundaes make really great little icy snacks. Not the best mnemonic, but it'll work. The inferior phrenic arteries, these are paired arteries. And a lot of these are gonna be paired, but some of them will not be. And that's a great exam question there that we'll get into is which of the following are not paired. So the inferior phrenic goes right underneath the diaphragm. Then we have the celiac trunk and the celiac trunk is not paired. It's our first non-paired artery. There's a lot of things coming off the celiac trunk. The first one is going to be the left gastric artery. The next branch is gonna be the splenic artery and the common hepatic. And remember, anytime we see the word common, we know that's gonna split later on. Off of the splenic artery, we get a branch called the pancreatic artery, the left gastroepiploic artery, and the gastroepiploic right and left are gonna to anastomose together. So there's not just one artery, there's lots of good collateral blood flow to the stomach area. Off of the right gastroepiploic, you get the gastroduodenal, then the superior pancreaticoduodenal, and then the common hepatic is going to give some collateral blood flow here. So the common hepatic actually uh, connects with the gastroduodenal, and then the common hepatic is going to give us the proper hepatic, and then the proper hepatic will split into the left and right hepatic. Off of the right hepatic, we also have the cystic artery, which supplies the gallbladder. The common hepatic last branch is going to be the right gastric, and the right gastric and the left gastric will also anastomose. So there's got a, anything that's a dotted line is an anastomosis or collateral blood flow. All right, next we go back to our abdominal aorta, and that's going to be our superior mesenteric artery, not a paired artery. 
Off the superior mesenteric artery, we have several branches. The first one is the jejunal, which goes to the jejunum. Then we have the ileal artery, which goes to the ilium, the middle colic, the right colic, which goes to the ascending colon, iliocolic. Off of the iliocolic, we have the cecal artery, which goes to the cecum. And then we also have a branch that goes to the appendix or the appendicular branch. And then finally, we have the inferior pancreaticoduodenal. And if we remember that the superior pancreaticoduodenal, let me get my pointer here, is over here, we've got the inferior side over here. Next, we're gonna to go to another paired uh, artery. This is gonna be our middle adrenal glands or our middle suprarenal arteries. Then we have our renal arteries, so our right and our left, that's a paired one. Then our gonadal arteries, that's also a paired one. Then our lumbar arteries, also a paired one. And then we have the IMA, the inferior mesenteric artery. This is not paired. So superior and inferior mesenteric arteries are not paired. So the branches off of the inferior mesenteric are gonna be the left colic, which is gonna be the descending colon, the sigmoidal, which is gonna be the sigmoid colon, and then the superior rectal, which is gonna to go to the rectal area. Then we have the median sacral, which is not paired. And then finally we end in the common iliac. So there is a lot of stuff going on on the abdominal aorta. Some of the biggest ones that I love to tag in anatomy would be the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric because they're so clinically important and they're not paired and they're, they're nice to tag. So I like those, make sure that you can identify those on your cadavers. Next, we're gonna go into the pelvic artery. So we're gonna continue down from that common iliac. So the common iliac, as it goes underneath the ureters, then it's gonna split into the internal and the external iliac on both sides. Off of the external iliac, we have that inferior epigastric branch. And remember that that is the one that anastomoses with that superior epigastric on that first slide that we did. We also have a deep circumflex iliac, that's a circular artery. And then off of the internal iliac, we're gonna talk about these branches here. We have an anterior division and a posterior division on both sides. Off of the posterior division, you have the iliolumbar artery, the lateral sacral artery, and the superior gluteal artery. Off of the anterior divisions, we have the inferior gluteal arteries, the internal pudendal arteries, the medial rectal arteries. In females, we call this the uterine artery, and in males, this is the ductus deferens artery. In females, the next one is called the vaginal artery. In males, it's the inferior vesicle artery. The obturator artery the superior vesicle artery, and then the umbilical artery. And it's important why this is obliterated means that it scars down. Once you are born, you no longer need that umbilical artery. So it becomes obliterated or scarred down. It's no longer functional. So these are all of your branches of the pelvic artery. And it's important to be able to recognize these on your cadavers because some of these are pretty, um, pretty easy to tag. Definitely make sure you know your iliacs. All right, next we're gonna talk about the lumbar plexus. And this is getting into some nervous structures here. The psoas major is a really important muscle here because the psoas major is kind of the marker for what lies on top and what's medial and what's lateral. So the psoas major is that muscle right there in the center. The genitofemoral nerve is going to pierce the psoas major and then lie on top of it. And you can see the two branches, the genital branch and the femoral branch on top there. Then as we get rid of the psoas major, now we're gonna see the rest of the lumbar plexus. So we have the subcostal nerve. Then we have the iliohypogastric nerve. And that travels with the ilioinguinal nerve and then it separates later on. Then we have the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh and that applies uh, cutaneous or sensory sensation to the lateral part of the thigh. The femoral nerve is very large and then the obturator nerve. So the obturator is gonna be the most medial one. 
Okay, so here's our lumbar plexus. So interested in getting lunch on Friday is our mnemonic. So we're looking at T12, L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. That's gonna be our lumbar plexus. So we're gonna start off with T12 and that's gonna be the subcostal nerve. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of my video here. That's gonna give motor to the external and internal oblique muscles, the transversus abdominis and the rectus abdominis and the pyramidalis muscles. So these are motor to these nerves. Then we have that iliohypogastric nerve that's gonna give sensory to the pubic and the gluteal regions and motor to the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. So it's kind of redundant with that subcostal nerve. Then remember our ilioinguinal is the one that travels with that iliohypogastric and that will give you sensory to the medial thigh, the scrotum and the labia, and then also provide that motor to the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. L1 and L2 come together to form the genitofemoral nerve, and that will give us sensory to the femoral triangle. It will also give us motor to the cremaster muscle, the scrotum, the scrotum and the labium magus muscles. L2 and L3 come together to form the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, that's L2 to L3, and that's gonna be sensory to the anterior lateral thigh. L3 and L4 come together to give us the accessory obturator. Only 9% of people have this, and you'll never know that you have this unless you're a cadaver that's being dissected because it doesn't really matter. It supplies the pectineus muscle, but we have redundant uh, nervous supply there in case you don't have an accessory obturator. L2, L3, and L4 form the obturator nerve, which gives us sensory to the medial thigh and also motor to the thigh adductors. Remember this from your lower extremity unit and then the, the hip and the knee joint. L2, L3, and L4 also give us the femoral nerve, and that's gonna be sensory to the anterior and medial thigh and leg, and then also motor to the pectineus, the anterior thigh muscles, the hip and the knee joint. So if you see there, if you don't have that accessory obturator here, then you have your pectineus muscle is innervated by your femoral nerve. And then finally, L4 and L5 come together for the lumbosacral trunk, and that goes down into the sacral plexus, which we talked about in your lower extremity unit. Sacral plexus, here we go. So sacral plexus, L4, L5, S1, S2, S3, and S4. This is kind of an old friend of ours. We did this in our lower extremity unit. So some of these should be familiar to you. So remember L4, L5, S1 is gonna give us the superior gluteal nerve. That's gonna give us motor supply to the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. Then we shift down one. So L5, S1, S2 is gonna give us the inferior gluteal nerve and that's gonna give us innervation to the gluteus maximus. Remember from your second unit here that these repeat. So L4, L5, S1, again, is gonna give us another nerve. So nerve to quadratus femoris and inferior gemellus. So superior gluteal nerve and nerve to quadratus femoris and inferior gemellus all have the same uh, nerve roots, L4, S1. Then again, we repeat L5, S2. That is not only for the inferior gluteal nerve, but also for the nerve to obturator internus and superior gemellus. Then we're gonna come down, remember the tibial nerve, that's the major portion of the sciatic nerve. The other part of that is the common fibular, the common peroneal nerve, per peroneal nerve, excuse me. Those together form that big sciatic nerve. And if you're doing a cadaver lab, you will not miss the sciatic nerve. It is a very large nerve that goes down the posterior leg. Then we have the posterior femoral cutaneous, which is gonna be S1 to S3. Then we have S2, S3, S4 form the pudendal nerve. And the pudendal nerve gives us uh, motor to the anal and urethral sphincter, the pelvic diaphragm, the bulbospongiosis, the ischiocavernosis, and sensory to the penis and the clitoris. It also has some inferior rectal and perineal branches, and that's going to give motor supply to the scrotum, the labia major, and the perineal muscles. Then we also have S2, S3, and S4. That's gonna be our pelvic splanchnic nerves. And if you can remember, pelvic splanchnics are our parasympathetic to our pelvis and our colon. The sacral splanchnics are gonna be the sympathetic chain. So remember S for S, sacral splanchnic is sympathetic, pelvic splanchnic is parasympathetic. That's an excellent exam question there. And then finally, we have the nerve to levator and nigh and coccygeus, and that's gonna be S3, S4. So here's your sacral plexus. I don't know if you guys are tired of having plexi yet, but the, between the brachial and the sacral and the, and the lumbar plexus, you have a lot of them. 
that was all I have for you for this unit. Um, again, if you'd like to purchase the full PowerPoint, a full video, the muscle summary charts, the highly tested concepts, which are the clinical pearls, the highly tested radiology terms, and then blank versions of the roadmaps, the clinical pearls and the muscle charts, you can find those at the papods.weebly.com. It's $25 per unit. There's a total of four units of these available and that those four units will complete our series on the anatomy reviews. So I hope that helps and I hope you all have a great day.